you know, it's really nice and it is always fun to be back in Texas. It's been a while since I've been to Shriner University and the Texas Honors Institute. Uh, the last time I was here 16 years ago, I had just met my husband. So, yeah, I have fond memories of this place. I really want... Can everybody hear me now? Even, sure that was me. No, even with my spectacles, I needed Debbie um, to do this. Are you helping with PowerPoint or am I doing it all? PowerPoint. Thank you, thank you. So, I'm here to talk about the Honor City topic in general, a little bit about why we have one. If any of you ever said, why do they have an Honor City topic? Right about this time of year? No one? No one in Texas has ever thought that. Oh, uh, yeah, there's, <laughs> yeah, in December you might consider it. I have Molly's hand up. That, thank you, Molly. Uh, because a lot of times we have people ask that. And I want to tell you a little bit about it and how we develop it. But then I also want to talk about the topic itself and our eight themes because it's the cornerstone of honors in action. And I know for a lot of you, you're really interested in the honors study topic as it relates to honors in action. And Texas does such a great job with that. Uh, that I'm happy to be here to, to get to talk about it. Okay, so these beautiful people you see here. Uh, the honor study topic is developed by a group of people known as the Honors Program Council. A couple of these images should look familiar to you. There are a couple of Texans in that, in that group. Dr. Melissa Fulgham and Dr. Blake Ellis are members of the Honors Program Council. We meet every year in the summer. In fact, we meet at the end of next week. Um, as a matter of fact, in Jackson, Mississippi. But we meet every year to talk about what the next honor study topic will be. So while we're talking about how the world works, global perspectives today, we actually have a new topic. And we're writing the honors program guide next week. So we work two years out. All of the, the people here, there are four um, headquarters staff members, and then there are eight chapter advisors who apply to be on the honors program council. So based on their experience and their knowledge and their um, interest in being student-centered and their understanding of honors in action, they're selected to represent different disciplines, different uh, places in the Phi Theta Kappa world, uh, different perspectives, uh, preferably. And then if you see Joan Fedor there, for those of you who are at the Honors Institute, Joan Fedor is a former regional coordinator. Um, she's a longtime member of the Honors Program Council, and she also supports the Honors Institute financially, which is really wonderful for us. And so uh, Dr. Fedor has been on the council, I, I want to say, for about 20 years. Um, and, and her question to us every year, or I guess it's her statement, to us every year as we're developing, well, there's a question first, is always, where are the arts? And I am going to make an arts comment today for Joan. It's all for Joan. And then her other, her other statement to us is always, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> And it's great because you figure over 20 years to be able to be stupider and stupider is quite the accomplishment. Uh, so, you know, we're proud of that. So they're wonderful. They're wonderful to work with. They work very, very hard. And like I said, we work two years out. And the reason I mentioned that is that the Honors Program Council has eight criteria for any honors study topic. And we follow those really closely. And any topic we develop has to fit these criteria, or, or we throw the, the mouse. I guess never give someone of Italian heritage a, a portable mouse, because I can't keep my hands in front. Usually I just I forward the slides with them. I don't break the, um, the mouse. So I apologize and thank you, Tommy. So here's what we do. We look first, it has to be international in scope. It's really important that we're an international honor society. It has to be global. So while global perspectives is part of this title of this honor study topic, thank you, it is always in our minds. Um, and we've had international members, advisors on the Honors Program Council who will tell us at times, you know, that isn't going to work for an international community. You need to really rethink this. You're thinking like Americans. And you're not thinking beyond that. It's very valuable for us. So we do consider that, and we want the topic to be international. It has to be. It has to be interdisciplinary. 
for those of you who have said before, oh, this is a broad topic, we just can't think of anything. You know, we don't get it. It's deliberately broad, it's deliberately inter uh, interdisciplinary, because we want all of you to find something in the topic that you love, that interests you. Um, and everybody has different interests, right? I said, Jones is always the arts. We always want it to be there. But for you, it may be something entirely different. And our membership really is made up of people of you know, all different uh, places. And, and it, I think you, you mentioned the diversity, how important it is, uh, and all different disciplines, people who are studying different things. The honor study topic has to reach everybody. So then it also has to be intellectual. Uh, so it's really important to us. You know, remember that academic research part. How many of you have worked with the honor study topic before? And how many of you, it's, it's brand new to you? Okay, and how many are you saying, I'm not lifting my hand because it's going to make me perspire? <laughs> a few, a few, yeah, I get that. Um, so it, it has to be intellectual. We want you to do academic research. And so we're really careful about looking at an honor study topic that allows you to do that. So we want it to be there. We do want it to be interesting for you. So again, we want you to be able to dive into it. We want you to have fun. We want it to be interesting. We want people to embrace the honor study topic. That's important to us as well. Um, we want it to be important. And the next two eyes are, are sort of connected. We want the topic to be important. We want it to be in the news. And remember, I mentioned we worked two years out. We actually developed the 2018-2019 topic last year. Um, and we've been sitting out. We think it's, it's really good. We're excited about it. But it has to be important enough that it will be in the news in two years because we're working so far out. So anything that's sort of trivial, that sort of catches our fancy, but you know, we know in two years it's going to be gone. We aren't going to select. I mean, we really do consider that. Will people be able to get into the topic in two years when we're finished and we're ready to announce it? So that's important as well. And then it's got to be theme oriented. And we're going to talk about those themes. But there has to be some way to help you dive into the topic. So just saying the topics, how the world works, global perspectives, you know, isn't really enough. We want you to have some idea of the types of things that you might consider as you're working with the topic. And then about eight years ago, so probably four topics ago, um, it had to be action oriented. Because the honor study topic is the cornerstone of honors in action, you have to be able to research it, you have to be able to discuss it, and then you have to be able to do something, right? So if it's not action-oriented, we can't use the topic. And we do consider topics that we think are fun, and we want to talk about, but we think, you know, what could, what could students and chapters do with this? And if there isn't a wide variety, then we don't use the topic. We still have fun during a meeting talking about it, but we don't use it um, for the topic. So all of these things are in our mind when we meet, and we, we sit down and we talk about it, and we, we go through the eight criteria and say, does it fit? You know, let's, let's look at every single criterion and decide whether this fits, um, and if it does, then we can move forward with the topic. This is um, our 50th anniversary topic coming up. So the other thing about the topic is that it was um, developed in 1968 for the first time. Uh, for our 50th anniversary. And since we are going to be 100 this year, this is the 50th time um, that we've, we've had a, an honor study topic. Now it's, now, it's currently two years. It used to be one year. If you look at the back of the honors program guide or look online, um, it used to be just study for one year. And then we, we made a change because we really wanted people to get delve more deeply. And we thought two years would be a better way to do that. The first topic um, was about American culture, 1800 to 1860. So it's a little different, right? They were using maybe different criteria at the time um, when they were developing the topic. It's fascinating, uh, but it's really narrow compared to what we're doing now. Um, the first Honors Institute was at Endicott College in Massachusetts, and it lasted for two weeks. So. <laughs> For those of you who just finished Honors Institute, so we've made some changes since then. Um, although you know, getting to study at Honors Institute for two weeks actually warms the cockles of my heart. Um, if you can stay in a dorm for two weeks, it's all good. But we've, we've made some changes. We're happy about those changes. And I'd like to talk to you about how the world works, global perspectives. And I'm sort of glad that a lot of you haven't talked about the Honors Day topic. 
I looked in the newspapers in the past couple of days to try to pick my examples um, so we can talk about the themes and show you that the topic's still in the news. So let's go ahead and look at the, the eight themes here. Um, and I, I apologize, I changed the, the slide afterwards, but I didn't notice it until uh, this morning that this isn't just going to be theme one. But the theme one is myth and reality. And I think Michael was reading about myth and reality when he started uh, the session today. So let's talk about myth and reality. I give two examples. I have Nessie up there. How many of you would love to see the Loch Ness Monster? Yeah, these are fun. Of course, it doesn't exist. This photograph was doctored, um, which is, I guess, before Photoshop. It's pretty clever um, to have done that. And if you go to Loch Ness, um, of course, Loch, Loch, uh, the Loch Ness Monster is everywhere. Thank you. Nessie is everywhere. And you can actually take, if you got one of the boats, you can take a picture with uh, Nessie out the window so it looks like Nessie is floating in the water and you can proclaim that you've actually seen. Um, I guess Nessie, if it's Nessie, it's her. So we'll just go with that. Um, see Nessie. Um, and, and so, you know, they made a whole industry out of this and it's important for them. But why is it important for us to believe that Nessie exists? You know, that that story has persisted. Um, and it, it's, it, if you think about those things, why do myths persist? Why are they important? You know, why do we have television shows um, about, uh, oh gosh, Jeff, what is, I'm always uh, saying that you, you proclaim never to see it. Sasquatch. You know, why, why do we have TV shows where people are still chasing Sasquatch? Um, and, and Bigfoot, yeah, it's, you know, why is that? But something about those stories resonates with us, right? Even if we know that Nessie doesn't exist. You know, that, that they use sonar, they think maybe there's a big fish down there, maybe there's some sort of sea monster um, that might seem like Nessie. And again, the, the photographer took um, advantage of that with a, a really cool photograph. Um, and it would be really cool to see it, but it doesn't. But there are other kinds of myths, and I'd love for you to consider some of these too. Um, consider that the myth persists that if you're wealthy, you deserve to be wealthy. You did something right. If you're poor, you did something wrong. You deserve to be poor. It's sort of your fault to be poor. Uh, we don't love to talk quite as much about those myths, right, as we like to talk about Nessie. Um, but why is that? Why does that persist that we want to believe that if you're wealthy, maybe you have um, more imagination? You know, you worked harder. Um, I'm guessing almost everybody in this room works hard, right? But if you don't work for yourself, you don't, you're not the CEO, are you going to get wealthy? Maybe. Isn't that part of why we like to believe it? You know, it's, it's within our control. Uh, maybe, but how do the truly wealthy become truly wealthy for the most part? Yeah, the old-fashioned way. They inherit it. Um, and their wealth comes from unearned wealth, unearned income. Um, that doesn't make me that they're bad, right? The, the reverse isn't true either. It's not that if you're wealthy, you've done something wrong. Um, that's not the case. But you may not be wealthy and have worked very hard all your life, done the right things, you know, done what you've loved in your life, but not have created that kind of wealth. But we like the idea, and maybe it just makes us feel better when we go to bed at night, that if you're poor, you know, what did you do to get there? Or what did you not do to get out of it? So I'd love for you to consider some myths like that and why they persist and why uh, they're at least implicitly important to us. Um, they're good for conversation. Hopefully some of you um, will be a little outraged and when you go to your seminar meetings you'll talk about that one um, as you go through. That because we tend to talk about the stories and the fun things like Nessie when we talk about myths and reality. But the reality is that, that most poor people work very hard. Uh, that's not the causation um, for them being poor necessarily. So I hope that you will discuss that one. So let's talk about theme two, individualism and collectivism. And this one's a tricky one, and I want, especially if you're working on honors in action and you're thinking about it, what the council meant by this is the concepts of individualism and collectivism. Well, we saw a lot last year um, when people were really talking about theme two was that they thought, well, I'm an individual, and I'm doing something good for other people. Um, but that's not what we mean by this theme. So if, if you guys are working in that, 
um, you want to shift a little bit, you probably can find something else in, in one of the themes that works that way. But it's really the idea that in some cultures, individualism is important. And in others, collectivism, doing what's good for the, the whole rather than for the individual is the thing that's important. Now, which one do you think fits here? Got a chart. Individualism, um, at, at least that's, that's culturally what for this nation and for much of the Western world, um, individualism is important. Why is it important? Why is individualism important to us? Okay. I would believe in individuals' rights. We're going to get to, to that one else. Okay. Whole idea of self-reliance, you know, the self-made person pulls herself up by her bootstraps and she's wearing boots. Right, that we can do that, that makes us feel like we can all make it. You know, you just rely on us, do any of us only rely on ourselves? Very, very few of us. I'm sure there really are people, there are always exceptions, but most of us have some connectedness to the world. That doesn't mean we're not individualistic, it just means that most of us can't make it without other people. Um, but, but still, how did that develop in the, the nation that becomes the United States? How does it develop in the Western world? Why are there other cultures who believe um, that, that collectivism is the way to go? Um, and that's a question we'd love for you to consider. Um, and, and in the news right now, of course, is, is health care. You may have heard. If you turn on a television or a radio or you look at a newspaper. Um, for our country, health care is in the news. And there are some real debates about whether health care should be based on individualism or collectivism. And we have a state senator in Texas who had a very individualistic amendment to the health care bill. The idea that you know, those of you who are young could buy very inexpensive health care plans that um, really wouldn't offer much protection, but you sort of, the idea is you don't need it, right? Because you're healthy and you're young. And then people who are, who are older, um, <clears throat> who uh, maybe have uh, pre-existing conditions, um, would have more expensive health care, more expensive plans, because they need them. The idea is that they would need those more. The problem with that, of course, is that's not how insurance works, right? <laughs> you need healthy young people in the insurance pool to really uh, mitigate the risk for the insurance industry of people with pre-existing conditions and people who are older. I also would say part of the, the deal with with healthcare is that uh, the, a falsehood is maybe that young people never use insurance. They do uh, when they're having children, right? I mean, some of us who are you know born after the earth cooled, shortly after, um, you know, are not there anymore. So our health insurance isn't going to be necessary for childbirth, but for some young people, it really is. Uh, but that's that's a very individualistic way of looking at it. That if you can afford healthcare, great. You can afford the best care in the world. Now on the other side, you maybe have someone like Bernie Sanders, and what does he want? Free okay. universal health care. That for, for someone like Bernie, um, health care is a right, and it's a responsibility of a good government to provide that health care. Um, that's very collectivist in its point of view. Um, and for some people, that's, that's the thing. And some of you said that very enthusiastically. So I'm guessing there's some Bernie supporters in here. Woo! <laughs> uh, I guess I did ask Ted Cruz supporters. There have to be some of those too. He's a senator. All right, there you go. Um, but you know, that's those are very different views of health care, and they're having difficulty, right? Even though the Republican Party controls both houses of Congress, has the presidency, you know, really has the judiciary. Um, even though that, in, on the national level, is is sort of bipartisan, or it's meant to be, um, and they still can't pass a health care bill effectively. There are really different points of view of what it should look like, whether it should be individualistic, whether it should be collectivist, whether it should be some combination of those things, and we haven't gotten there yet. We aren't likely to get there in August, too, but you never know. Um, and then there are lots of things in the news that relate to theme two, so we hope you consider those. Now, Theme three, rights and responsibilities. Um, we had some interesting things this morning, um, and Jeff actually pointed it out to me, that the others have messed up some paperwork, and so the student, I know, go figure. But the student, um, they shouldn't, right? I mean, they really should not. 
but the student loans that have gone missing, those people are not going to have to pay back their student loans. At least it looks that way right now. There are, your loans are there because there are, of course, people who got student loans from the same company and been harassed about paying them back, and they did. Well, their debt is they're not going to get refund checks for having done that right. Um, so there's some really interesting things. You know, what right uh, do students have when they're, they're purchasing or getting student loans and they have to repay those? Um, how does that work? You know, what rights, what responsibilities do they have in doing that? Um, when I was in graduate school, I had a roommate who worked for a company that helped collect student loan debts. She's a really nice person, and I'm sure she didn't harass anyone in this room, uh, or at least I hope not. But she said that actually the number one group of defaulters come from what, um, what category? What do they do for a living? Okay. They don't. Oh, oh, they said teach over here. Casting aspersions on instructors. <laughs> so you're, you're a troublemaker and an instructor. It's not teachers. Um, doctors are number two. Lawyers are number one. People who go to law school, people who go to medical school, um, default on their loans um, more often. Not just because they're higher, but lawyers know the law. They know how to skirt around that, right? Um, and she said it was really interesting working. Uh, with them and working with people who knew what their rights were, what their responsibilities were as they saw it. Um, and so I thought that was an interesting rights and responsibilities um, thing in the news. I also thought, this is maybe an instructor, rights and responsibilities. There was a Pew Research poll that came out that shows that 58% of Republicans and about that many, uh, that percentage of independents who lean Republican believe that colleges and universities are driving the country in the wrong direction. Yeah, really, it's in, it's in the paper today. Um, so, so those of you who are instructors, um, but you know, there's, if you look at it logically, and I think it's something really interesting to discuss with rights and responsibilities, what is the responsibility of a professor in teaching? You know, are there, are there points of view, can anyone truly be objective on um, what is the purpose of a college or university education um, you can look at those things, and then you can also look, it's a little bit, it's not myth and reality entirely, but you can look at it and say, well, okay, if professors are so good at this, at driving the country in the wrong direction, then why is it that we have both houses of Congress uh, that are the same party, and the president who's the same party, and a lot of state legislators um, who are the same party, professors aren't doing a very good job then. So maybe we're moving people in the wrong direction, we just haven't gotten all the way there yet. Uh, but it's interesting to discuss, right? I mean, what are colleges and universities? What's the purpose? Uh, and you may have, I think some chapters really look at this, should you be able to go for free? Should you be, <laughs> I heard a no back there. <laughs> but should, you free, should it be free for two years? I mean, there are really interesting rights and responsibilities issues related to education. And they're worth discussing. You know, whether or not that's what your chapter ends up doing for honors and action, they're, they're cool topics to discuss. So theme for peace and war, and I know tonight you're going to hear, I'm gonna guess, is that someone Melissa Fulton talking about it? Because Melissa, uh, Melissa just won a Moselle Award, um, and she her topic is, is about peace and the, the peaceful tradition of, of certain religions in the United States, and um, I, I can't wait to hear her. Um, she's, she's wonderful, and I'm excited about it. She wrote the introduction to this piece in the Honors Program Guide, and to me, the most provocative part of it is that for 92% of human history, we've been at war. That's really remarkable when you consider it. We say we like peace, right? Give peace a chance, imagine. Um, we're always talking about peace, and we're always singing about it, and um, really saying that's what we want, and yet, over 90% of the time, we choose war over peace. Um, why is that? Are we just competitive animals? Like nobody likes to be wrong. Um, are we are we maybe no different than other beings that when it gets crowded, when things don't go our way, um, I mean, our dogs, when they want to walk in the house and they love each other, they jockey for position to see who gets to walk in first. Um, you know, what, what is that about? They both know they're coming in and getting a treat, um, and yet, they jockey. Are, are we like that as humans? Is there really, any of you 
uh, you may do this, but when you're driving, you go have to get one car ahead no matter what consequences. Uh, you're not a self-respecting Texan if you don't. <laughs> Every once in a while, yeah, where the whole outcome and, and reward is that you are one car ahead of the car you just cut off uh, at 80 miles an hour. Uh, so we, you know, at 65, all right, good. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. Speak, speaking of rights and responsibilities, do you have to follow the speed limit? I mean, are there some laws meant to be broken? Tested, pushed the envelope for that. Um, but I think it's interesting that there are, there are consequences you know, of war that, that aren't just about weaponry and sending people into battle. There are big questions about that. You know, uh, in fact, I can stand here and talk about it. I'm not going to war, right? Um, but some of you might, if we instituted a draft um, and, and have to end up going to war. We send young people into war. Very often we send people um, who are economically disadvantaged into war because it offers opportunity, um, or we at least promise that it will offer opportunity. And there are questions, but there are also questions. This is my Joan Fedor part. Um, if you've been reading the news lately, it's really been for about the last year, especially you see it. Um, so many artifacts and beautiful buildings um, and priceless objects are being destroyed, particularly um, in Iraq and particularly by, um, in Afghanistan by the Taliban and in Iraq and ISIS currently. But in human history, there are lots of examples of that. It, it makes me sad as the person who teaches humanities and, and history, what I teach is, you know, those things tell us so much about cultures and about what they believed about peace and war, what they believed about rights and responsibilities, uh, what they believed about individualism, collectivism, and destroy them. You can't bring them back. I mean, unless you're Disney. That's a different thing. Um, it's, really, it's really disheartening. So we lose a lot. We lose a lot of social capital. We lose a lot of the world and a lot of our history and a lot of what makes us human because of war. And is it worth it to do that? So it's another question to consider in how the world works. So let's talk about beauty and vulgarity. I, I use this image on purpose. We actually were going to put it in the honors program guide. Um, how many of you love cats? Yeah. Very good. How many of you dislike cats? OK. Ah, there you go. Now, I, I do want you to know my mother hated cats. And I used to always say to her, just remember, Lincoln loved cats. Hitler did not. Just saying. I'd love to give her a hard time about that. <laughs> and actually, it's true. Actually, Lincoln thought of cats as sort of a hobby, um, and, and uh, Hitler didn't like them. Um, and I, I don't know why, in that case, he didn't like them. But let's talk about because we talk about his uh, beauty and vulgarity a lot in human terms. You know, what do we see as beautiful? Um, you know, why is that important? How does it change over cultures? But I want to use cats, and I, because I, I love this image, it's sort of beautiful and vulgar at the same time, you know, it's sort of common, and if you, especially if you don't like cats and you look at that, you think, ugh, I really don't like cats now, uh, and I hope that's not my water. Um, <laughs> it could be, cats can get everywhere, you know. Um, so in talking about cats, there was some really interesting research in the paper today that um, it was actually about dogs, so we'll bring dogs into this a little bit too. But um, John Bradshaw, who, who wrote um, about cats, he researches cats, and he basically says cats you know, were at one time revered. The Egyptians revered them and saw they were, they were godlike. Um, actually, in Indonesia, when I was there, um, cats were on the streets, and what they'd say is, well, Muhammad loved cats. They would bring them in as pets, the way you know, some of us do. But they also wouldn't harm them. They coexisted peacefully um, in the streets because they didn't think it was, it was important um, to harm them in any way. They also didn't name them, um, my cat's Izzy. So they also didn't name them Isabella and bring them in to sleep in the bed and you know, give them Sheba once a day. Um, so yeah, there, are, there are sort of divisions there. But it's interesting, um, in the 16th and 17th and even some into the 18th century, cats were also seen as evil in Europe, right? I mean, what's wrong with cats? <laughs> 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 
right? I mean, there's the connection with the devil, probably the, the connection with um, naughty women, you know, women who, uh, who make history because um, they aren't following the rules necessarily. But um, they're, they were seen as evil. To this day, shelters will not adopt out black cats around Halloween because they fear that they're going to be harmed um, in rituals. So it, it's sort of interesting to see that beauty and vulgarity, it, it's in the eyes of you love cats. Uh, you see them as beautiful, sleek, wonderful creatures. And, and Bradshaw, by the way, says that most likely they see us as big cats. But they know dogs don't see humans as, as cats. They sort of recognize that we're a different species. But the cats maybe, to the best of their knowledge at this point, see us as big cats who dole out food, like their mothers. Um, which is sort of, sort of interesting since they don't need us all the time either, except at maybe mealtime. Dogs are, are really different, and the, the really interesting thing that was in the news this week about dogs um, and beauty and vulgarity is that you know, we see dogs as being very closely associated with what animal? Bulls, right? And these also beautiful, sort of sleek creatures, um, when you look at them physically. Um, dogs, in it, we don't always see them that way, um, but but it turns out that they've had an evolutionary change. The, the reason dogs like us better than wolves do, even trained wolves, is that their genes have mutated. And it means that they're going to be more connected to us. That's why they come when we call. Or when I, I go out to yoga class and I come back, the dogs run out and we have this big ritual. And I tell them how many downward dogs I did that day. <laughs> um, I know it's stupid. But clearly, I have a lot of animals. Um, I see them as beautiful. I see all, actually all creatures as beautiful, even if I don't want to coexist with some of them like snakes in my house. But, but I do. Um, I don't see them as, as vulgar particularly, um, even if I have an irrational fear of, you know, said snakes. Um, so beauty and vulgarity doesn't have to be about humans. It can be about non-human creatures. It can be about art. You know, it can be about music. How many of you love hip-hop? Wow, wow, so really the right side of the room or the left side of the room, some hip-hop fans. How many of you hate it? How many, <laughs> how many of you sort of think, like, I actually love it when there's some melody involved, when there are mashups, like Eminem and Rihanna. I mean, I, I think that's really beautiful, even though I don't want to listen to the words. I, I, I'm sort of humming along and loving it. Um, I was at love you till it hurts, and I think I start listening to the words and thinking, okay, maybe you shouldn't be thinking, and, you know, you should not be loving this song. But but it's this incredible melody, and then you know, Eminem is, is really good on that that particular track. So uh, I love it. But beauty and vulgarity can be about other things, and I, I want you to think about that as well. It can be about our human physical beauty or lack thereof. You know, our vulgarity, what we see as common, um, what we not don't see as common. But consider it beyond that and look at some other creatures as well. Okay, natural and engineered. Another thing in the news today, how many of you like Usain Bolt? Now, this is no, but really the fastest man in the world. And he's incredible. Um, SMU researchers have been studying him, trying to figure out what is it about this man that he's so much faster than anybody else in history. He's so much faster than everybody else who is an elite athlete, an elite runner uh, and sprinter. And they sort of, they're sort of turning a corner with him because they found out he has scoliosis. So his legs are not, and his legs are not the same length. And they figured out that his right foot stays on the ground 14 seconds before it comes back up, which is seriously longer than other runners. It's about four seconds longer um, than, than other runners, and for some reason, you think either his gait makes him fast, or the fact that he adapted to that gait because of scoliosis makes him fast. He runs the 100-yard dash in 41 paces. It takes every other runner 43 to 48 paces to get the same distance. Now, part of that's his height, because he's, what, 6'5"? But it's fascinating. They're studying this, this man, this human being, to figure out what is it he does so that we can sort of engineer training, that we can sort of engineer shoes. There's an article also in, in USA Today. The first one was in the New York Times. USA Today has an article about Tiffany Beers, who is um, the, their engineer with Nike, who's figuring out how to make the shoes from Back to the Future. Could help you go. 
and she's got prototypes all over her office. And you know, the fact that we can try to engineer being able to move as some, you know, as fast as someone like Usain Bolt is pretty incredible. Uh, so natural and engineered, I, I actually used the airplane photo just because I love that photo of the lightning striking all around the plane, and the plane, the plane landed safely, just in case anyone was worried. Um, yeah. But there are other things like that. You know, Usain Bolt's part of popular culture. He's part of the sports world. You know, Nike sort of controls a lot of um, the gear for the sports world. But why is it so important to us? that we want to study the natural world in a way that try to figure out how can we be faster, you know, or stronger. Um, why is that important to us? It's sort of an incredible thing to have humans do, um, but they're doing it really successfully and in interesting ways. So if you want to run like Usain Bolt, um, you may need to grow a little. And I think uh, it was probably the same thing with, with Michael Phelps. In fairness, and SNU is not studying him, but they have studied him. And his, he's got short legs compared to his torso, and his, his wingspan is what's huge. And I think that part of his being able to get to the, the edge of the pool before anybody else is that wingspan. He also trains really hard. So it's not just all physiology, and it's not for Hussein Bolt. Although Bolt doesn't train as hard as some other athletes to do it. He's just a natural phenomenon. All right, so let's look at um, innovation and replication. Another thing that's been in the news really for the past few months, and it's there again today, Elon Musk, what's he up to? Yeah, he's digging a tunnel. What's he going to put in that tunnel? <laughs> yeah, this sort of super, um, what's the word, Jeff? Thank you, Luke. The Hyperloop. We've had trains before, right? We've got some nice kitty trains and around Texas where you can go and they, they might go a half a mile an hour and you can so watch where they're going. Elon Musk wants to have, have people make the trip from Los Angeles to San Francisco in 29 minutes. Um, and he's like shooting them through this tunnel. And he's interested in a Washington, D.C., New York tunnel that's about 30 minutes. Think about going that fast, getting between those cities um, in 29 minutes. Uh, it would be extraordinary, right? I mean, just to experience that. And then uh, my mind thinks, maybe I'll wait until they figure out the accident part of that. <laughs> or like being stuck in that tunnel, um, in that thing, and when it's not working and you're there for three hours, um, that might be a little bit claustrophobic. But it's extraordinary that we're working on things like that. That we're working on engineering being able to go replicating trains, but in a way that allows us to move extraordinarily fast. Think about if you don't have to be on uh, California freeways. Um, think about if you came, uh, as Jeff and I came from Houston, um, and it, it took for various reasons, including uh, construction on I-10, it took us almost six hours. You know, we'd be able to do it maybe in 20 minutes. That it would be extraordinary to be able to do that. So we'll see, you know, Elon Musk has a lot of money that he's putting into changing the world and changing the way the world works. And so that will be exciting to see. Now, nostalgia and pathos. So this is going to be um, the last theme. That, by the way, is on my maternal grandfather and grandmother um, up there. And I, I put them up there, of course, because I love them, but also because I wanted to talk about with with um, nostalgia and pathos. There are lots of things to talk about here. Because most of us are nostalgic for things. There are pathos, you know, the, the idea that we're looking back, but there's some pain in looking back. You know, they're, they're connected in that way. Who would I when I was five? So I did know him. I didn't know him well. So everything I know about him is from stories. I mean, I certainly know his name. His name was Thomas Arthur. So you can remember him now, too. Uh, my grandmother actually lived to be 95, so I knew her very well. Um, Margaret Arthur. Um, she actually was Margarita, but um, she, because it's Italian, but uh, she, she always said it was Margaret, do not call her Margarita, and we are not from southern Italy. Um, it turns out we did the DNA test, we are from southern Italy. Um, so, you know, she's probably turning in her grave that DNA tests have been developed and it, it came out. Um, that it was that way. But I bring that up because when we're looking in the past and we're looking at families, we're really interested in that. Um, you'll take those DNA tests. You also can have them for your dogs too, by the way, in case you're interested in that. But uh, you take this test 
we want to know the names of the people who came before us, to know whether we were uh, related to uh, George Washington and, and Jeff's case. Um, he's not. But that's a family story you see over and over with people who like didn't have children. Um, and so it's really not likely that you are related to them. But, and we, we're really interested, we're interested in that kind of nostalgia for us, right? I mean, we want to know who those people were for us. But researchers say we actually remember two generations. Um, we remember them as, as people for two generations. So, you know, I certainly um, know my mother well. I can tell great stories about her. I knew my grandmother very well. Um, but my great-grandmother, I'd have to, look up, have to look on a sheet that my cousin did to know her name. And I certainly don't know anything about her except that she loved the movies. That's the only story I can remember about her. And I hope some of you are thinking, gosh, wait, do I know my great-grandparents' great names? Do I know my great-great-grandparents' names? Do I know something beyond that that helps me understand? And it's sort of, it's not one of the cheeriest things to think about because it's, you know, people say, oh, I want to be remembered. Um, and it's difficult because researchers say we just don't do that as humans. We don't remember um, the past as well as we think. We remember it, and we don't remember people as humans. We don't remember what they liked, what they loved. You know, and, and people, the best thing you can do, if you want your children, how many of you want your great-grandchildren to know who you were? Oh, sorry. Some of you are like, oh, great-grandchildren, really? Yeah, so some of you, so what would you do to make that happen? Okay. Could be photographs. What else? Maybe videos? Yeah. yeah, and of course, what's going to be the trick with that? Thinking about, oh, like themes uh, six and seven, what's going to be the problem with the photos you leave and your videos and your, your Facebook pages and your Instagram? Yeah. Times change, right? And so something else is going to come replace those, and your great-grandchildren may never see that stuff. Right? Um, it could be that actually, um, in that, this is historians, uh, or people who teach history say keep a journal because very likely uh, they'd be able to read it, although, how many of you text? Okay. Probably many more of you. Language is changing, right? <laughs> so, um, so, for example, when I was growing up, POS meant point of sale. <laughs> I'm guessing you know what it means now because you laughed. Um, it's very different, right? So if somebody uh, who was my mother's or grandmother's age looked at POS, that would be what that meant. That's where you find the cash register. Um, so at your age, your great-grandchildren might be saying, really, that's what they thought POS meant? Um, so you may have to maybe do a dictionary of texting. I mean, I know there are some out there. But for your great-grandchildren to remember you, you have to think about what do you want them to know about you or hope that they'll know. And then you have to keep up with technology. You have to be nice to your children and your grandchildren. Um, <laughs> Make sure they say nice things about you. But you know, when you're looking at things nostalgically, it's, it's easy for us to remember really heartwarming or maybe horrifying stories about our parents, maybe about our grandparents. But I'd love to talk to you this weekend if you really know really incredible things about your great grandparents or your great great grandparents beyond their names. Um, and it's something that, that readers who say is just an interesting part of human memory and what's important to us and why we don't remember people. It's very hard um, to, to remember. And I guess I should ask, how many of you could tell me a lot of stuff about Millard Fillmore? <laughs> Betty, the time to talk to Betty. He's the president of the United States, right? So even becoming the leader of the country doesn't guarantee you are going to be remembered. Um, sometimes you have to take that into your own hands. Uh, and so we hope that you'll look at interesting things like that with the Honor City topic. Know that it, it isn't all history, although I would love that if it were. Um, it isn't all the arts, although Joan would love that if it, it were that. Um, find something in there that interests you, that interests you collectively, because I know how many of you are officers? Okay, great. So you're here to work in teams, to lead a team that's going to look at the Honor City topic. So you may have to find something that, that really engages you collectively. But on behalf of, of headquarters, on behalf of the Honors Program Council, uh, we hope you have a grand adventure looking at our honor study topic. Uh, we think it's wonderful. We hope you think it's wonderful. 
And I will tell you that we look forward to hearing about what you've studied and what you're doing. And we thank you for leading the way for chapters in Texas because it's really important to us. It's important to our mission. And uh, thank you. And I can't wait to hear the rest of the presentations today and get a chance to talk with some of you um, about the honor study topic and honors in action and Phi Theta Kappa. And thank you for bringing me back to Texas. Woo!